Hello. Uh, today um, we are going to start with the, our first chapter, uh, Values and Types in Programming Languages 242. Uh, so uh, today we are going to talk about the value and type so that in a programming language we talk about everything that has a value and type and we end up uh, in talking about expressions of the programming language. Uh, so what is value and type? <clears throat> First of all, uh, programming language without a value means something like math without numbers. Our ultimate purpose in computation is to uh, have co uh, computation on values, getting some values and uh, having some computation on that, manipulating it, uh, calculating and other operations that we can do on a value so that we end up in some other value. So we have inputs and outputs. So everything uh, that can be computed, stored, or uh, that can be passed as a parameter, returned as a value, can be assigned to a variable and uh, put on a file uh, is actually a value. However, in a programming language, instead of uh, the standalone values, uh, this value or that value, we actually talk about uh, the values that have uh, some uh, similarities or the values that belong to the same set of operations that, or that can get the uh, same set of operations. And this is what we call uh, data type. So uh, the value is a single thing and type is the set of all uh, values of same kind. Uh, you uh, already know about data types in the programming languages you have done so far, uh, like C data types in car long or uh, unsigned short, long, long, float, double, 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 and pointers of anything, the uh, structures, unions, and arrays. In C++, we have, in addition to that, we have uh, classes or actually when we talk about value, it is class instance, the object. When we talk about uh, the data type, it is class. Uh, in Haskell, uh, so this will be our functional paradigm language throughout the semester. Uh, we have data types of Boolean, integer, uh, float, uh, real, and so on. We have character strings. And we can compose values out of existing values like tuples, records, uh, lists, and uh, functions. In Python, we have a Boolean, integer, float, complex, str, the string, bytes, tuple, list, set, dictionary, and all uh, library uh, values that you can have, data types, or user-defined classes and functions. So uh, when we have this uh, set of values term here, uh, that we uh, define here. Uh, so the set of values, the set of values doesn't have uh, anything in its own because an arbitrary set of values doesn't compose a data type because we have something important. Uh, our purpose of having data type is to uh, establish operations on that. So the computers, carry on operations on data types or values. So when we talk about an operation like addition, we have to have same characteristics for all of the values taking part into that addition operation. So uh, this set like this one doesn't have similarities between the uh, members. So it is not a data type. If you like something to be a data type, that set should have some uh, behavior or some set of operations defined on that or some set of similarities uh, among them. So we have uh, the operations that can be carried on, the data type should be consistently carried on on all of the values in the same way. So, 
in a typical programming language, we have uh, primitives and composite data types. I can show you a couple of uh, programming languages and their uh, data types, if you like. So, sorry about that. Okay, um, in Haskell, uh, we will be using Glasgow Haskell com uh, compiler throughout this course. Uh, so it is uh, invoked as uh, GACI. Uh, I stands for standalone. Uh, sorry, I stands for interactive. Uh, the uh, GAC itself is a compiler, so you can have a Haskell file and it will compile it into a binary, but this binary will be a little bit uh, fat binary, including uh, the Haskell runtime. So actually it is an interpreted language, so you can have all of the operations like that. Uh, to illustrate data types, I can use this one, uh, column T, to show the data type of a value. And it is a little bit hard uh, to read uh, for this data type. But uh, it says that uh, the uh, if p is a number, the data type is p. So uh, it is a member of uh, a number class, this data type. But if you ask uh, the data type of 2.3, it, it says now it is uh, fractional. Sorry, I need to do that. Uh, so this is a fractional, P is fractional. So it goes like that. Uh, but if you ask the data type of true, it is going to give you only one value, which is Boolean. Uh, or if you ask uh, data type of, for example, a, it is going to give you car. So these are the data types, the primitive data types of uh, Haskell. If you switch to, uh, for example, Python, in Python we can ask the same question with this type and four is integer, 4.4 is float, 4.4 J is uh, complex and a is a string and uh, what else? One, two, three is a tuple. So it goes like that. Uh, I am not going to give examples of C. You already uh, know about that, I believe. So uh, in a programming language, we have actually one uh, typical characterization of data types, primitive data types versus uh, complex data types. Complex data types are usually defined by users and primitive data types are uh, the data types that cannot be decomposed into uh, smaller values, sub values. So it is uh, implemented as a whole and you don't have uh, this part or this part of the data type. Please do not um, uh, confuse it with, uh, for example, bit masks and so on. So taking first bit of an integer in C is actually another integer. So it is not a different data type. But I'm talking about sub values. So you get one part of the data type uh, which will give you another data type. So this is composition. Uh, in uh, C, we have, for example, integers, floats, doubles, characters, uh, long, short, all these uh, numerical data types are primitive data types. In addition to that, we have pointers. Pointers are also uh, primitive types in C. In Haskell, we have Boolean, integer, float, and also function values. So this is interesting, are primitive data types uh, or first order data types in this case. In Python, we have 
Boolean integer float. And we have an interesting example here, which is string. String is actually a composite data type in other uh, languages, but in some languages like Python, uh, string is implemented as a primitive data type. It is stored as some uh, on a hash table, and as you uh, need them, it is brought from that hash table. So it is implemented as a primitive value. Uh, the next thing we uh, are going to talk about is cardinal triplet data type. So it is like set cardinality. How many uh, distinct uh, value that a data type can take? So it is like the number of members or uh, number of members in a set, actually. And we are going to represent that as this uh, pound symbol, pound data type. So for example, Boolean has cardinality two and card has cardinality 256 short this one and integer double and it goes like that. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, if a data type can have that many distinct values, uh, it is going to give me a clue about uh, how much storage I need for storing that data type. So if it is, uh, for example, 256, I can reserve a byte so that byte can uh, store this car. But if it is a bool, actually, I need only one bit if my architecture supports that, or I can have uh, some other mechanism, I can store it in a single bit. If it is 32 bits, so 2 to the power 32, so I can store it in uh, four bytes, and it goes like that. So uh, for any such data type, if you know the cardinality, you can uh, get an idea about storage complexity, how much storage uh, value can uh, occupy. So basically, you can uh, simply uh, write uh, this simple formula, which is so it is, so it is log two of cardinality of t bits are needed. So if you divide it by eight, you are going to find how many bytes that the value occupy is required to store the value. So it is um, just uh, value for uh, approximating the storage requirement. Now, uh, but actually we are not talking about the compression or uh, algorithms or data structure for accessing the uh, data type. So you can come up with uh, some, for example, compression algorithm to store data type more efficiently. Okay. so. Uh, this is only for having some uniform distribution of values and having uh, one uh, value reserved for one member of the set. Uh, in addition to uh, primitive data types by the programming language, we also have user-defined uh, uh, primitive uh, types. So they, these are uh, like uh, any other built-in data types like integers, etc. But the difference is user gives some names so that they are more readable and they are more accessible, uh, easy to follow and uh, code. So basically you can consider this user-defined primitive data types as mappings uh, to some sub-range of integers. Uh, in C, the best example is enum actually in uh, C enum R is the uh, is like an alias to the uh, integers. So Monday here is actually zero. Tuesday is one. Wednesday. So you can say this: if uh, Monday equal or if the uh, day equal three, you can ask that question. Uh, 
uh, in uh, Pascal and Ada languages, they are interesting in this uh, user-defined primitive types. Uh, you can define ranges. So a day is one to 31 and they have uh, the uh, type checking mechanism so that it is going to complain if you, for example, try to assign 32 to G. So G is a variable of data type. They, so this is going to be rejected at runtime. In order to implement such a thing, you need to implement it at the runtime. Uh, so the, uh, This special case, which we call discrete ordinal primitive data types, uh, your data type is uh, one to one mapped into a range of integers. So, for example, when you uh, say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so you can define a set here. So, Monday is zero, Tuesday is one, Wednesday is two, Thursday is three, and so on, and Sunday is six. So given six, I can tell you Sunday, and given uh, Saturday, I can give you five. So if you have such a, a mapping, you can also do other things. Like for example, uh, if this is a variable D, you can increment D. Or you can say D is next of D. Or you can ask this question, what is the order of D. So these are uh, like, actually this is, if I use successor, it is in Pascal. Uh, so it is going to give you the integer value, like five. Successor is going to give you the next day here, or uh, predecessor is going to give you the previous day and so on. So it is uh, just uh, for, uh, representing values that fits in the situation. So uh, consecutive values. So, uh, Wednesday is not a number. Wednesday it's not integer. However, given Wednesday, you can tell me the next day. So they are in sequence, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on. Uh, discrete order primitive data types are important because they can be used as switch case labels in programming languages. Uh, as you know, in C, for example, we have that restriction. The switch labels uh, have to be integers. And same holds in, for example, Ada and Pascal. So the case label, they call it case. Case labels have to be discrete order primitive data types. In Pascal, we have uh, some strange restriction. Only they can be used as loop variables. So this is not. Uh, something productive and uh, so I wish Pascal has this uh, strange uh, behavior so in, for example you can say fourth day is uh, between uh, Monday and Thursday so you can have such a loop uh, in Pascal but not floating point values so this is uh, uh, another thing I forgot to talk about is array indices. Uh, this is uh, also important because uh, the array implementation uh, is efficient in uh, programming languages like C and Pascal because uh, if you like to access fifth element of an array, what you need to do is you have storage wise jump to the fifth location. So it is just an arithmetic of size of uh, the value times uh, index and you get this offset from the start of the array and you will access the uh, member of the array. In order to implement that, we have that restriction. The array index has to be integer like in C or in Pascal Ada has to be discrete order primitive data types. Why? Because what we do is very simple. We have that calculation, convert that value into integer and make the arithmetic and calculate the 
element, element index. So uh, after definition of primitive data types, uh, we need uh, larger values to store more information. For example, personal, uh, personal record, record of a per, uh, student or uh, the uh, grades of all of the students in the class. So if you look in your uh, environment, you will see that uh, instead of a single value, we have uh, the groups of values related to each other. And in order to keep that relation, we need to define uh, more complex data types, or we can compose existing uh, data types into uh, new data types. So we are going to talk about uh, the Cartesian products and other types of uh, compositions. So basically, uh, in this course, we are going to talk about uh, this uh, three basic uh, compositions, the Cartesian product, disjoint union, and mapping. Power set is quite rare, but these three are quite common. So we are going to talk about th those compositions. And then we are going to talk about the uh, recursive compositions. It is not a new composition. Uh, the recursive compositions use Cartesian product and disjoint union. However, they are important because they let you define uh, this infinite uh, well, uh, infinite sets. So the data structures uh, are constructed by these recursive compositions like lists and uh, trees. So our first composition is quite familiar uh, from the uh, elementary school, and sorry, high school. Uh, so basically it is given two data types, S and T. I can define all X, Y such that X is coming from S and Y is coming from T. So that if you are giving these uh, two sets, so the Cartesian product will be this one. Uh, and probably uh, you are going to notice that uh, this notation is similar to something. So this is the a value of this set. And this is another possible value. And this is another possible value. And if you see the similarity, this looks like Python tuples. And actually tuple is a Cartesian product in Haskell and uh, Python. And what about the cardinality? Cardinality actually it is not uh, difficult. So if you have such a Cartesian product, cardinality will be the multiplication of the cardinalities of each set. So uh, we have uh, examples like uh, C, ASCAD, Python, and it is uh, tuple. In C, in order to define uh, the Cartesian product, we need to define a struct or class uh, declaration all values, all possible values of, so this is one set, this is another set, and these two sets have the Cartesian product defined as person. So you have to give name to your new data type, it's okay, but also you have to give name to the fields, like this one. Uh, and now this X variable contains two sum values. One is the name, the other is uh, the ID. Uh, this one is like a nested definition, so one of the name is also an array, which is another composition. Uh, in Haskell, we have uh, the tuples like this, string and integer, and then you can define this uh, tuple like that. In Python, um, so in Haskell, the Pythons are restricted, so you define, uh, sorry, tuples are restricted, so you define a tuple of string and integer. So the first member should be string and the second can be integer. In Python, uh, the tuples are what we call heterogeneous. So it is uh, arbitrary values uh, can be put on the uh, members, the sub values. So let me give you uh, the examples of those. And Python and So this is the person is 
string and integers. So now uh, if you uh, define a value like like this one, uh, this is a notation in Haskell uh, for defining data types. So Haskell infers data types. So if you, for example, write something like this and ask the value, it is going to infer the data types and it is going to say that. So it is a tuple of character and numbers. So this is, B is numbers, so character and number. So this is the inferred data type. If you like it to get you the fixed data type you can denote it like that with double columns so now this one will be a person okay uh, so this is the uh, tuple so i can uh, define for example let me as this one so me will be again one two three one and you can ask first element of me and second element of me like that so uh, this since this is a composition you can get the pieces uh, out of this values and python uh, so when you define this tuple the data type will be a tuple so uh, there is no way to distinguish between the triple tuple and quadruple and so on uh, because it's a C heterogeneous, but it is non volatile, so you cannot modify the members of tuples. You are going to get errors. Uh, other than that, it is the selection operators exist, and we have uh, different tuples. For example, this is a zero tuple, this is a one tuple, this is a two tuple, and you have no restriction on number of elements that tuple can have. And also there is no restriction on the numbers. So it is a heterogeneous uh, tuple. In Haskell, uh, so when you try to compose a uh, tuple, so it is going to infer the data type like that, but the uh, sub values, the data types of sub values are fixed like that. Okay. So, this is primary uh, distinction of tuple implementation of Python and uh, Haskell. Uh, now, let us go back to slides. So uh, we can have also uh, triples, quadruples, or, or multiple Cartesian product, and uh, even you can have nested Cartesian products, so Cartesian products or products and so on. It will go, it will go like that. Uh, and these are the examples. And just I have shown you the homogeneous, uh, heterogeneous case, this case uh, the Python's heterogeneous, but there might be languages uh, or you can define uh, such uh, definitions. We have, you need to get this distinction between homogeneous and heterogeneous uh, Cartesian products. So for example, you can represent this one as double to the power four. That means it's a quadruple of four double values. So uh, the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous case is the subtypes is the same in a homogeneous Cartesian product, and it is denoted as s to the power m. And if you uh, try to get this cardinality of s to the power n in terms of cardinality of s, it is not difficult. It is cardinality of s to the power m. Uh, 
I don't know much languages having this restriction on uh, the tuples. For arrays, the array is something different, by the way. Uh, we have this homogeneous difference, important, but in, in case of uh, tuples, uh, I don't see much uh, programming languages making this distinct uh, difference. But we have something uh, interesting, which is what if the n gets zero? So if n is zero, it is called a zero tuple. And zero tuple set is very important. Zero tuple set has only one value. And this is something interesting. We have a data type which has cardinality one. So it has only and only one value. Uh, this doesn't uh, look quite helpful, but actually it is. Uh, it is not empty set, but it is a set with a single value. And we use that for termination purposes. So we can use it as nil or null or uh, as empty list and so on. So we can use that for uh, termination point. In Python, you can use it like that. Or we have a built-in called none. So it, it says no value. So it is, if you look into data type of this uh, tuple, it is going to be seen as tuple. Uh, but if you look into type of none, I'm going to show you the screen share in a moment. So it is non type. So it has non type. So it is a special class which has only one possible value and it doesn't do anything uh, other than indicating that it has no value. Uh, this is sometimes useful. In C, for example, we need that for void. Uh, so in C, all of the functions deter something. But if you like your function not to return anything, you define it as void. So it has no value. And if you try to uh, assign void or uh, return void or try to evaluate void at all, you are going to get an error. And it's in C, it has the whole purpose of generating error if there's something, uh, some invalid usage. Uh, for example, if you like to assign the return value of a void function to a variable, you will get an error. In Python, it doesn't uh, directly generate uh, the error, but it is used for indicating no value, uninitialized, and so on. Now, uh, we have a new uh, type of composition, which you are not uh, much familiar. Actually, you are familiar with uh, the case union, for example, S union T, you are familiar with that. So that, for example, if you have S equals one, two, and T equals two, three, four, if you get S union T, you are going to get one, two, three, four. So this is math from high school. But we have uh, disjoint term here. Disjoint says that uh, you cannot uh, uh, you you cannot combine uh, the intersection uh, the values in the intersection set of the uh, sets. So uh, the two coming from this set should be different than two coming from this other set. So it says that. Uh, you need, need to distinguish between the value coming from the set one or set two. So that's why we add some something extra here. This is we sometimes call a tag or label. So our value has a tag or label indicating that it is coming from this set or the other set, left set or the right set. So that when you get these two, this is our symbol we use in programming languages. Instead of union, we use this plus. So one, two, three, and 
three, four are coming from two different sets and left three and right three are not equal. In the union, two coming from this set or the other set, it doesn't matter, they are equal. But in this one, they are not equal. So they are coming from two distinct sets. And this is called the disjoint union. And the cardinality is simply, cardinality of them summed up. Uh, so this is basically the addition of the cardinalities. Now, uh, this, how this is useful. This is useful when you have an option. A value is either this or the other one. The value can be defined this way or the other way. And this is how you combine two different unrelated uh, data types into one uh, composite data type. Uh, C unions looks like disjoint unions because they are called unions anyway. Uh, has a completely different uh, purpose, and it is uh, just for storage purpose. So they are not actually disjoint union. So this one says that x is a number; it can be real or integer, but there is no other information. So it doesn't tell X is integer or real. And they are not safe because of that. So let me show you a C example. And so that we can see this problem. So let us define our union for uh, numbers. It is int i or double d. And let us uh, define x and y. And let us define x dot integer as four and y that double as uh, 5.1 and if you uh, be a nice person and print out them correctly like this x dot i and y dot d And print out them, you are going to get this result. Okay, it's a very nice result. Now, assume you had a mistake, and or not a mistake, but you forgot in which variable you stored which type of value, and instead you get this. Actually, I can have two lines. One is for the good programmers, the other is mistaken programmers and this is what you get okay so you assume you have zero content or in this one you assume you have a very large content this is actually uh, the ieee 14 point representation of 5.1 in the body of an integer and this one is the reverse the integer 4 in the body of an ieee 14 point representation so that's why the C unions are not safe. So if you like to have uh, advantage of that, you need to put this enum type T. And actually, you don't need this value. No, you don't. In the new uh, standards of uh, See, you don't have to have names in union and the field name here. Uh, now, along with this integer, you need to store that information. So x in 
integers or floats t. So I say xt is integers and yt is, yt is floats. And when I am uh, printing if uh, x t is integers, I am going to print it this way. Others, I'm going to print. This way. So I need to store that information and use it when I need it. And this is how I make sure that the unions are safe, which does not exist in C. You have to implement it on your own. However, uh, Haskell is not like that. In Haskell, we define uh, the disjoint union as a data type. You have to define it in order to use it. It is not that like tuples. In a tuple, you can directly use it magically, but not in uh, disjoint unions. So you define it this way. So these are the tags or labels of our data type coming from which of the resources. And instead of plus, we use this pipe symbol or bar symbol. So this is actually disjoint union of three data types. So it is basically uh, the sorry. It is uh, basically the float plus integer plus integer Cartesian integer. So I am using a nested uh, composition here, and I could call this numbers. But uh, this math notation lacks this tags. The tags are important for programming language in order to match the value. So now let me show you the Haskell example as well. So here, now I define this number as real value of real or most, there are many reserved words, so I'm trying to use non-existing one or rational numbers of integers and integers. Uh, these are some uh, magic words we use in order to show our data values for the time being to not mind those deriving show. I need to just to uh, not really but Both, sorry, not three, but both. Uh, so now uh, my data type is defined. So when I say, for example, data type of integral five, it is a number. Data type of rational of three, four, so it's like three over four, it's a number. So if it is a real value 4233, it is a number. So all these values belong to the same data type. But in order to uh, distinguish them, we use a tag. So this tag avoids uh, confusion of values. Uh, this is sometimes useful even in the same data, data type. For example, temperature is either Celsius of float or Fahrenheit of float. So what happened? Now I ah, sorry four and Fahrenheit four. 
looks like the same value. However, semantically, they are different. So in order to uh, use them in some sort of uh, computation, we need to convert them so that the units are compatible. So in such scenarios, they are also useful. But mostly we are going to use uh, this disjoint union data type in uh, the recursive uh, data types and structures. Okay. So our uh, next uh, composition is the mappings. It is going to look like something strange and unfamiliar, but actually it is quite a familiar thing, which is basically the arrays and functions. Uh, the definition looks a little bit complex, but I can read it to you. So for all X in the domain set, there exists a Y in the target set such that X, Y will be element of V. So now we are composing a new set of values and this new set of values will have each element of X mapped to a Y value. And such a set will be the member of our mapping set. So in the mapping set, each member like here is a set of mappings. Each value mapped to something else. Here, since I don't have uh, enough uh, space, or actually, it, otherwise, it will be very confusing, uh, enough colors and so on. Because in my mapping, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different mappings. But I just showed, uh, I just shown uh, each mapping as a different color. So I could only show three values here. Red is this value, green is this value, uh, blue is this value, and green is this value. So each possible mapping, A to one, B to two, A to two, B to one, A to three, B to one, A to one, B to three, and so on, uh, is going to be uh, a value of our mapping set, okay? So you can, cons uh, you can uh, think it like that, for all values in the domain set, it's going to give me a value. So I store a mapping so that when I get a value of a mapping, that value will contain, contain for each value of a domain set, a target value. Uh, the cardinality is a little bit uh, non-trivial, let me say, not difficult, but non-trivial to calculate, but uh, we can consider it like that. I have uh, I have uh, cardinal of S distinct values. So I have, in the S I have, let us say five values and each of them can get, so let me just, each of them can get cardinal of T, different possibilities. So I'm talking about different possibilities. First one can be mapped to one, two, three. Second one can be mapped to one, two, three. This is not a permutation, so it is repeated. So repeated values are possible. So it goes like that. How many times? No, cardinal of S times. That means it is number of cardinal of t to the power of cardinal of uh, s, okay? So uh, in this way, you can calculate that. Uh, and if you uh, look at the, for example, storage requirements of this value, it is cardinal of s times log two of t. So basically it is storage requirement of set T multiplied by cardinal of S. So this is actually a hint about the arrays. Okay, when you define, for example, 
uh, character array of size 10. So this is our domain set, which is 0 to 9. So this is our S. And our T is car. So I'm looking for a mapping from integers from 0 to 9 to character values. So that means I have 10 times size of car. So it will tell me about that. So uh, there are two uh, kinds of uh, this uh, composition. One is array, the others uh, are the functions. So, so this is the possibility. So this is a C array, which is actually a mapping from 0, 1, 2 to double. Uh, we have this restriction in the arrays of uh, especially primitive languages, uh, it's not primitive, the uh, imperative languages, and uh, the, integer, uh, the domain should be an integer range or discrete ordered uh, primitive data type. So this is, if you like, a declaration like that. So X is an element of this mapping in C. In Pascal, on the other hand, we have uh, the user-defined data types like days, months, or sub-ranges of integers. So you can say array day of real. Okay, so each day is mapped to a real value, like uh, weather forecast for the day, or each month is mapped to an integer. So we can have such mappings are possible. Uh, since it is discrete order primitive data type, Pascal implements that as Tuesday is like one in C and so on. Uh, the other possibility for a mapping is function, but the difference is uh, about storage and algorithm. A function defines the mapping as an algorithm where uh, the array defines the mapping in the storage. So it stores the uh, mapping values. Uh, so here, actually you are defining a mapping between integer to integer. But if you look at carefully, this function can only return zero and one, so you can define this as this one. Uh, the uh, C functions are actually pointers, so they are quite different than uh, the first order values. However, in Haskell, the functions are first order values and they are like actual mappings. So let me show you uh, the Haskell version. For example, x is if uh, mod x2 equals one, then false, else, true. Okay, so uh, this is how you define a function in. Uh, uh, sorry, I am confused with Python. So uh, this says that data type of f is. A is some integral data type, and data type of F is integral to Boolean. So it is integer to Boolean mapping. So in this way, you can functionally or algorithmically define uh, the mappings like here in uh, Haskell. Uh, please do not be confused. I accidentally Define a call, define a function called death this way, okay? Something which we don't know, P to A to Boolean. Um, so what is the difference? In the array case, the mapping is stored in the memory. In the function case, it is defined by an algorithm. In array case, we need storage. Also, we have the restriction. Only integer domain can be mapped. Uh, please 
do not be confused with uh, Python dictionaries, for example, they are data structures. Uh, they are not uh, actual compositions. The internal representation of the dictionary data structure is different than the composition we are talking about here. It is uh, actually having some different combination internally stored in the data structure, giving us the dictionary data type. Uh, so usually in the array case, the mapping is limited so that we can have simple math and store all of the possible values. Otherwise, again, we have some algorithmic definition. So Python dictionaries have some algorithms inside. But in the plain arrays, it is just a simple, uh, single-minded mapping, storing everything inside. So uh, double to double or string to integer needs some internal data structure. However, functions defined by algorithms, now we have another issue, which is efficiency. In arrays, we have storage efficiency as a concern and the uh, functions, the uh, CPU efficiency or uh, the algorithmic complexity is in the question, uh, how CPUs are used, CPU resources are used and so on. Uh, the, there is no restriction like integers and so on. So you can map a, uh, anything into anything. But we have other issues like side effects, like input output or uh, updating a global variable. So each time you call the function, you can get a different result. In the array, if you inspect the array, you always get the same value. So, F, uh, so the A5 is always same value in the array. But in the function, it is not, or it doesn't have to be. And functional languages, it is, but in uh, imperative languages with global variables and side effects, each time you call the uh, same function with the same parameters, may end up in a different value, like, like a random number generator. And we have one of the largest problem. You don't know if your function will terminate or not. In the array case, you know that something stored and you, this is going to give you some value, correct or not. But in the function case, it may end up in an infinite loop, may have some uh, segmentation fault or some stack overflow, and you will end up in nothing. So this is the uh, primary uh, difference. Uh, the, uh, in the Cartesian mappings, uh, we can also map just instead of a single data type, the domain can be a Cartesian product. In imperative languages, this is supported this way. Uh, in Pascal, it is more obvious. Uh, also in function case, we have the parameters can be composed like that. So now our mapping will be instead of integer to double, it will be integer times integer to double. But we have something quite interesting at that moment. The difference between the integer times integer to double and integer a function getting an integer or an array getting an integer and returning a new mapping, which is integer to double. So uh, this distinction is not obvious, but uh, we have one important uh, advantage in this uh, second case. So in mappings of mappings, you get a new mapping as you supply a value. So partial values, getting some result out of a partial uh, value is possible. However, in this one, you need to supply both of them. I'm going to show you in the uh, Haskell in a moment, but let us look at the uh, Pascal because this is a running example in Pascal. It is hard to generate that in C. So in C, we have pointers into game and changing uh, the game results. Uh, the, in Pascal, you can define arrays in two different uh, forms. So X is a Cartesian product array, one to three, one to four of double. Y is array of arrays. So we have, we define an array so that each element of the array is an element of size, array of size four. 
So it will look like this. So it is uh, X is something like that. It is like a matrix two dimensional array. Y is like this one. Not exactly, but like this one. Okay. This has, so both of them in Pascal can be used in this way. So the uh, individual cells can be selected in the exact same way. However, the second version can be assigned as a whole, but not the first one. And C array assignment does not exist, so it is not a good example, but Pascal is a good example. It allows you to assign it as a whole. So it's something strange. And C, you have the pointers, you can assign pointers, et cetera, but uh, this is quite a uh, unique case, different than the C case. Now let us look at, to, uh, look at the uh, function uh, version of the same thing. Uh, using Haskell. In Haskell, you can define the same function in two different ways. So we have G1, which is X, Y, and is X time X plus Y. Uh, I'm making, keeping making the same mistake again and again. This is how you define the function in Haskell, not the def. Uh, so this is our first function, which is Cartesian product to A. So it is number times number to number. And with a strange syntax, this is another way of defining pretty much the same computation. So in a Haskell, it is interpreted as G2 will get an X and return a new function. And this new function will get a Y and return this value. So when you look at the data type of G2, you are going to get this. And you should read this uh, right associatively. So you, you are going to assume that we have parentheses here, okay? Uh, so now they, Define the same thing. So G1, 3, 4 is 13, and G2, 3, 4 is also 13. So there is no difference here. Uh, only syntax is slightly different. Uh, however, we have one important thing here G1, 3 doesn't have anything meaningful. However, G2, 3. It also gets an error, but the errors are different. Okay, so this is more serious error. This one is about, I cannot show it. Okay, you gave me something useful, probably, but I cannot show it on the screen because there is no way to show the function. However, you can do this, for example, let W is G23. Now it didn't give me any error. Now W has something. So if you get data type of W, it is number to number. And you can use W for something useful. W4. What happens? I define a function out of existing function. Okay. Now my function is actually some three two stage function. In order to avoid, I have one stage supplying one value, the second stage supplying another value. And I can use this second stage for something useful. For example, if I say, define, for example, multiply xy as x times y, and I can define twice is multiply two. So, this is multiply, and this is twice, and twice, three, six. Okay. So out of existing definition, I have a new definition. And it is productive. We are going to uh, talk about this later. It is called curate form. Uh, it gives us more uh, product, product, productive implementation. And Python, you can do this uh, in a uh, more indirect way. For example, we have uh, in Python, I can define a function multiply by 
x, I define the second function, get y, and return x times y, and I return get, okay? So this is my function. So now I say multiply by three is another function. So I say t is multiplied by three, and then I say t five, I get fifteen. Okay, or twice is multiply by two and twice five is 10. So this is how I can do pretty much the same thing in uh, Python. But as you can see, definitions a little bit odd in the Haskell language. It is more uh, intuitive and easy to read. Um, so this is the mappings and how mappings are useful. This slide is pretty much telling the same thing. Uh, so. Uh, for uh, this recording, uh, I have uh, one uh, composition type is left, which is the power set. As I said, it is not much uh, common. Uh, it's a set of all possible subsets. For example, if your set is AB, all possible subsets are these. And cardinality is basically two to the power cardinal of S. Uh, there's only one, uh, purpose of having such a composition, which is implementing sets, literally sets. So if your uh, programming language needs to implement a set, this is uh, some uh, sort of uh, composition for that. And in Pascal, it exists. Uh, there are special languages like that. Uh, in uh, Python, it is implemented as an uh, internal data structure. In Pascal, it is slightly more efficient with one restriction, which needs to be a discrete order data type. So you define colors and you define a color set as set of color. And after that, A and B are set values so that you can define a set, take intersection, union, difference, membership test, or comparison as if they are uh, primitive values. You can process sets in this way. In general, in Pascal, it is used, uh, implemented as bit sets, so it is efficient, but we have the restriction of set size and so on. Uh, in C++, Python, they are implemented as class. So now uh, I'm going to stop this recording for uh, this session. Uh, next session, we are going to talk about recursive data types. So in the right-hand side of the composition, we will have uh, the declared uh, set, appears and we are going to define data structures out of that. So uh, we are going to meet in the uh, next recording uh, for timing, uh, goodbye.